This is a true uh, two campus event today. Uh, even though our focus is on the packing house, I am broadcasting from downtown Sarasota campus. Caitlin is at the historic Spanish Point campus. Mindy's in the background running the technology here downtown Sarasota. I'm in the Amicus Learning Center, which is a great little studio to do this. And uh, I'm so happy to uh, be here today to um, do another one of these little volunteer sessions where we all get to learn a little bit more about our campus at Spanish Point, our new orange marmalade and why we did that. And just, um, you know, years ago, someone asked me, John, how did you learn all that stuff about Sarasota history? And I said, well, you know, every day I just learned a little bit more. And as you do that, it kind of layers on top. And so I think that the opportunity that we have with little Zooms like this is to take up just a small part of something that's important to our campus, in this case, Spanish Point, and to learn everything about that little thing that we can. And then we'll come back another day and talk about something else, you know, and then it just kind of adds to. And so, you know, whether you are a volunteer at Historic Spanish Point Campus or whether you're a volunteer at downtown Sarasota Campus, um, it gives you more information that you can share with our guests, either to encourage them to head south or if they approach you because they've already been south, then you don't get caught not knowing what they already learned. You know what I mean? So I think it's great for uh, volunteers from both campuses to participate. So, Caitlin, how are we doing with the uptake here? Do we have, um, are we still welcoming folks into the Zoom? We do still have folks joining us. So maybe we okay. want to give it just another couple minutes and then we'll get going. I'll just chit chat a little bit more and then we'll get started with the program. But I hope everyone has a great holiday this year. Um, I had a chance to uh, see many of you this morning at the breakfast. I thought that was great. Uh, I had a chance to meet some new people and um, and I'm happy to see some of you who I saw this morning on the call with us this afternoon on the call. Is it a call? It's a Zoom. I think of it as a call. So again, I'll wait for Caitlin to give me the lead, but um, we, uh, we've we been having a lot of people down to the historic Spanish Point campus, a lot of new faces, a lot of people that have never been there before. And I thank any of you who are volunteering downtown, if you're sending them down our way, we really appreciate that. Um, last Sunday was one of our biggest days ever for attendance. We had like 500 people come in and uh, it was winter green weekend for us, but even so, um, that was great to have so many people come and enjoy uh, the Spanish Point campus. Many people come for the first time say, we didn't know it was on the water. And so we've been best kept secret for a little too long. All Jordan, right, Caitlin. Get started with your All writing. right, let's get started. So Caitlin and I were talking one day and uh, wanted to come up with a topic for my next Zoom program. And I said, why don't we talk about the packing house? Because the packing house at Historic Spanish Point Campus was such an important element to the homestead and to the prosperity of the farm. And I have to adjust the thermostat. because the air conditioner is very loud in the room where I am. And so this packing house was kind of the connection between the farm and selling the produce because all transportation back in the late 1860s, early 1700s, 1880s, 1890s, it was all by boat. We had no railroad, very few trails through the woods. And so if you were going to market citrus and vegetables, you needed to do so by boat. And in order to load all these bushels onto a large sailing schooner, you needed a dock. And so I, I've found in my research that I've never been able to pin down the actual date that the packing house was constructed, but we're starting to hone in on it. And it seems as if it was either mid 1870s or possibly as late as the early 1880s. But we'll keep working on that to learn what we can. But in kind of reading between the lines of some of the family letters and other things, we can get a sense of what was going on when. And um, 
So anyway, I want to chat with you just a little bit before we get into the slides, and then we'll go through the slides, and they will kind of help to reinforce some of the things that I've talked about, and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, it's just amazing that this family, um, you know, um, John Webb, his wife, his wife's sister, their five children, they moved to Florida just after the American Civil War from New York. And they'd never been to Florida before. All they knew about Florida is what they'd read and what they'd been told. But they were intent on setting up a farm because they had to earn a living, you know. And they were so blessed by being on the bay because they had all the protein that they could ever need. They had fish. They had oysters. They had all the different shellfish. They had deer that they could hunt in the woods. But, you know, they weren't going to be able to sell that because everybody had that. What they needed to do was to produce agricultural products. And John Webb was a smart guy. And so he studied and consulted with other people and said, what should we grow? And then he learned very quickly certain things grow in wet soils, certain things grow in dry soils and that sort of thing. So the first crop was, you know, vegetable garden, just so they'd have something to eat. And before they even built their first house, they had beans and other things grown in the vegetable garden so that they could have something to go with all their seafood and venison that they might, you know, shoot a deer here and there. Um, the early stories don't talk about them eating a lot of deer. Uh, the deer come up mostly in describing keeping the deer out of the vegetable gardens, you know, keeping it away from their products. Um, by the early 1870s, you know, within a couple of years of their arrival, they were growing enough cabbage, onions, watermelons, pumpkins, eggplant, okra, that they had more than enough for their own family and that they were in a position to market these products. Uh, and the two chief places to market this type of product was Key West and Cedar Key. Key West, because it was really the largest city in Florida at the time, and Key West being a port city, always had high demand for fresh produce. Cedar Key, because of the little magical connection across the state with the only railroad in Florida at the time, went right over to Fernandina. And Fernandina on the East Coast was then the port city that would take you up to New York. So in order for the webs to really get the best price for their produce, they either had to get it to Cedar Key or they had to get it to Key West. Now, in both cases, there were steamers. Uh, so, for instance, if you got to Cedar Key and it took the railroad, it was likely a steamer that went to New York. But you could also put your produce on a steamer at Key West and go to New York, actually a shorter route, cheaper transportation, and you made more profit. Um, by the early, uh, by really the late 1870s, early 1880s, now the citrus had come into its own because they had planted this citrus crop early on, but it takes a couple of years before you really produce enough citrus on the trees to make it a sellable crop. But they had oranges, they had citrons, they had lemons, they had limes, uh, they had guavas, they were growing bananas, and so, and as early as we see in the records, the early 1880s, John Webb was becoming famous for his orange marmalade, hence the orange marmalade. So there's a historical connection between the Packenhaus marmalade and our history at the historic Spanish Point campus. Um, the Webbs learned that most of the money was made in the shipping. And so if they had to pay someone to ship their products from Osprey to Cedar Key or Key West, they were giving up all their profit. And they realized that they needed to be more in control of their own destiny. So they went shopping for a sailing schooner and they found one in uh, on the Manatee River and it was called the Ruby. And so the Ruby uh, became their their uh, wagon of the sea, so to speak. Um, and the Ruby could could carry about four tons worth of produce so they could load it up and take it to market. Um, in 1881, they became somewhat disgruntled by the Cedar Key situation because what would happen is they would bring all their citrus and produce to Cedar Key. And if the railroad didn't have enough capacity on the trip over to Fernandina, it would just stay in the warehouse till the next train came. And their, their produce was going bad. And so they decided to focus more on Key West. 
And so um, what we'll see in the slides that we'll get started with in a minute is that there was a significance to where they placed the packing house on the homestead because it needed deep water access. And so uh, there's amazing deep water that I'll show you a nice old map from the 1880s and you can see how that worked. Um, but before I forget, I do wanna say that if they sailed to Key West, it was really like a two week adventure. They would sail down, it would take them several days. They would spend some time in Key West. They would sell everything that they could there in the local market and anything that they couldn't sell there, then they'd try to engage, you know, transport on a steamer for the vegetables or citrus to go up to New York via the Key West route. Um, if they went to Cedar Key, it was a couple of days up, a couple of days back. Apparently, they didn't spend as much time in Cedar Key when they went as they did in Key West. But you could imagine, uh, while Cedar Key was an important port town and the railroad and everything else, Key West was kind of like the hub of everything. So if they needed tools or they needed some cloth to make some clothing out of, they could go and do some shopping there with some of the money that they had made from selling their produce and get what they needed um, and, uh, and then come on back to Osprey. So I think with that, I'd like to go ahead and share the screen and get started with the slides so we can actually look at some cool photographs that we've been putting together. And, um, and uh, so we'll get started and I call this one Packing House History. And this is a, a wonderful photograph that we have of the original Packing House, uh, probably taken from the top of the White Cottage, from the roof of the White Cottage. And this is a very uh, focused view. You'll see a different image here in a couple of minutes. But the one thing that will strike all of you that are familiar with the Spanish Point campus is how you don't see any mangroves. The, a year after the Webbs arrived, they arrived in 1867. The following winter was exceptionally cold. It was so cold, it actually froze and killed all the mangroves along the shoreline. So this image is probably 10 years later and uh, maybe more even, and uh, you're seeing the result of that. And so the packing house today is surrounded by mangroves as you'll see in a couple of minutes, but here it's just wide open, but you can see the dock projecting out and the existing packing house is the identical dimensions of the original one. As you can see from the photograph, it looks just the same. The dock are the exact same dimensions. A tremendous amount of care was put into, um, you know, how the packing house would be reconstructed, which occurred in 1990. And so these are some of the things that I already started to talk about that we'll cover today. Why a packing house? A little bit about the web farm. So the webs had about two acres and bananas and sugar cane right out of the out of the gate. Um, they had about 10 acres of other vegetable uh, gardens. And all of that was just off of what's now the Spanish Point campus. If you think about coming onto the campus and you're over by the Native American burial mound, all the land to the north that's now houses was the big farm. Bertha Palmer later converted the Webb Farm into the Duchesne Lawn, the, the extended piece of Duchesne Lawn. So if you've seen any of my programs on Bertha Palmer's gardens, I talk about how you know, she didn't have to flatten out Duchesne Lawn. That was the old Webb vegetable garden. And then the grove, as we understand it, for the citrus was back east of Mary's Chapel. What they would do back in the day, they would take and clear the hammock land, the dense oak and cabbage palm and red cedar and hickory, they'd clear that because that soil was so rich that then they could grow um, the citrus on that. It was also a little higher and drier than the surrounding lands. Uh, we'll talk a little about design and materials of the packing house. And if I forget to do that, please, please ask me at the end a little bit more about that. And then we're gonna look at some of the boats that they used and then what I call kind of fall and rise, which is, well, what happened to the original packing house? And then how did the new one get there? Then we'll talk about orange marmalade, then we'll do some Q&A. So this is just one of the photographs that we have of the Webb family on their homestead. And uh, this particular house was on the highest part of the mound. This would have been just west of what's now the sunken garden and pergola. Uh, Bertha Palmer actually converted the original Webb house into a little tavern and she called it Webb's Tavern and hung a little sign out there. But again, the family came down 1867, just after the American Civil War from New York. They were amongst the first uh, of the American settlers here in the area. When they came down, the only neighbors they had were the Whitakers up in Sarasota. There was no one in Venice, no one in Nokomis, no one anywhere else, really. 
um, Seminole Indians out to the east. Um, and that was about it. And then within a couple of years, more and more people would come and settle around them. You can see the fencing uh, in the foreground of the image here. And again, they used a lot of fencing to keep the deer away from uh, both their vegetables and, and their plantings right around the house itself. And this is a, a map that kind of speaks to the location and the location of the packing house. So I know it's, it's filled with information, but you can see North Creek up here. And that's to the north of us. That's kind of the north boundary of Osprey that John Webb used when he applied for the post office. This is all Little Sarasota Bay. This is the northern end of Casey Key right here, looking a little different than it does today. Actually looking somewhat similar. Um, this is the what was called the Bird Islands back in these days. This is now the Jim Neville Marine Preserve. This is all that mangrove uh, out in the bay between historic Spanish Point campus and Siesta Key. And then this is, if you can see my cursor, it's right on the southern tip of Siesta, right up at the very top of the screen. But here you can see Spanish Point and you can see the Indian Mound going way out into the bay. And then you can also see, if you can see my cursor, this is where the Guptill House is. They called that Deer Point. You can see how that's a little point that juts out there too. Um, you don't notice it so much when you're there, but think about that next time you're on campus. And then you can see some of the little trails. This was a little trail that went through the woods and connected to the road up to Sarasota. And you can see they went far enough east that they could ford the little shallow part here of, um, you know, uh, North Creek and then another one up here. And then you can see, um, this is interesting. This is likely, this little spot here is probably the original Webb Homestead House. This appears to be another structure way out at the end of the point. Um, and then this is likely the barn that they built, although we don't know exactly where that was. It probably wasn't too far away from the farm. So this was probably not too far away from the burial mound. Um, but look at what we have here. This is water depths in feet at low water, five feet, six feet, four feet, five feet, seven feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet. And this is the old Little Sarasota Pass that took them north and out into the Gulf of Mexico, right where Point of Rocks is today. That pass is now Heron Lagoon and Turtle Beach Lagoon, but that was the route that all their sailing ships took to get from the packing house, which is right here, out to the Gulf of Mexico. And then look at the rest of the bay, one foot, three feet, four feet, three and a half feet, one and a half feet. So you couldn't, you couldn't take these sailboats to Sarasota in the bay, it was just too shallow. You had to do all of this in the Gulf of Mexico. But isn't it amazing that, um, that there was so much water depth here? There was like a natural channel. And indeed, um, this might be one of the reasons why the Native Americans built the shell mound the way they did, paralleling this deep water channel that was meandering through the, a very shallow bay. So taking advantage of this deep water was the perfect place for the Packing House dock, which would have been right about here, right about as this road comes down this way. And then for those of you that are really familiar with uh, Spanish Point campus, you might recognize the shoal out here, the shallow water spot, where on any given weekend, you can see boats get stuck because they don't know it's there. And this was called Trout Keys uh, back in the day. Anyway, so here's kind of coming back, looking at the full shot, again, probably taken from upstairs or the top of White Cottage, looking out toward the packing house. And then uh, you can see this uh, little trail here. This was called the Wagon Road. It was nothing more than the shoreline of the bay where they would bring the vegetables and the citrus down here, run it inside the two double doors into the packing house, do all the processing, then out through the packing house to the waiting schooner, and then off to Cedar Key or Key West. In the background, uh, we can see another dock that was built years after the Webb Packing House this was Saunders packing. This was Saunders warehouse out here on the dock. And then Saunders store was back here. And uh, the remnants of that are still exist in the form of pilings in the ground, uh, but there's no other uh, surviving piece of it. It is on the property of Spanish Point campus. It's down at the Southern end. And there's really no way to really get to it, but it's down there. Anyway, this packing house, I can't emphasize how important this was to the Webb family. This was built 
uh, likely before the boatyard. It was built uh, likely before White Cottage. We don't have any super early photographs because nobody had a camera. Um, this photograph you can see is actually probably from about 1909 or 1910. It's a postcard view. You can see that the photographer put Osprey, Florida in type on it. And uh, so we're looking at the packing house here that probably at this point was already 40 years old, you know, 30, 35, 40 years old. Another close up view. I like to kind of hone in on these views and see what you can see. I've been trying to figure out if the packing house roof was originally metal or shingle. We have a metal roof on the one now. This kind of looks like a metal roof at this point, but I would have to believe that the original roof would have been shingled. Um, and then uh, it probably would have been done over with metal at a much later time, uh, perhaps in time for this postcard photograph to be taken. And the reason why I say that is when you look at this roof, it looks more like a V crimped metal roof than it does a shingle. The original uh, roof was damaged and they put a new roof on it then, but probably unlikely because John Webb had passed away by this time and the Webb's Winter Resort was raising a lot more money than off of visitors, you know, tourists staying at the resort and the, the farming wasn't quite as important to them. And again, just another close up view. Um, this is uh, Janet Snyder Matthews is a local historian who did all the original research on our campus to develop the original master plan. And uh, her uh, research indicated that basically once the citrus trees were producing a lot of fruit is when the packing house was created. And then she also makes reference to the orange marmalade. And the earliest letter that I could find referencing the marmalade was 1881. This is a map that was used for planning purposes. Um, this was developed back in the late 1970s, uh, actually before the property was donated. But it's kind of a compilation of what things used to be like when Webb was here. So uh, just to get you oriented, if you look over to the far right hand side where it says original Osprey Road to Sarasota, that's the paved trail that runs right alongside the Welcome Center gazebo. So you come in this way, um, this is the burial mound. This is where they had the, what they called the perjury. This is where they would make their uh, cane syrup and their molasses. Um, and so, and then uh, it's believed that the sugar mill itself where they ground the sugar was off a little bit to the West. You'll notice this notation for a spring. If you've ever, this is kind of the, what we call the crossroads, you know, at Spanish point now, this, this is the homestead, the, the high road going out to White Cottage. This is kind of the low road to White Cottage that did not exist in Webb's time period. But anyway, right around the intersection here, this is where there's a spring. This is also where John Webb in 1871 discovered the first uh, mineralized human remains. And the human remains were so fossilized that when the uh, Smithsonian scientists first saw them, they thought that they were ancient man, like 10 or 12,000 years old. And uh, that would have been unheard of at the time, because at the time, um, anthropologists and archaeologists figured that people had lived in Florida for maybe a thousand years. They had no notion of them living there. But when these bones were like rock, but then Webb tried to tell them that he had noticed that this highly mineralized water from the spring would form concretions and it would turn regular sand into rock. And so he kind of theorized that these bones had mineralized because of the nature of the water. And that's exactly what the case was. But also this whole area north, okay, this is kind of, uh, we figured the sugar cane was grown around the mound in the low area because actually Bertha Palmer filled in quite a bit around the mound. And prior to that would have been the area where the Native Americans would have borrowed the sand from around the mound to stack up on the mound. So you had low wet areas there. You had the low wet spring here. So we figured the sugar cane and the bananas were all grown around here. And then you had this uh, big 10 acre farm reaching way up beyond my Zoom screen um, where all the vegetables were grown. And they, they really, we don't have any um, evidence that they hired anyone to help them do all this. It was basically the family doing it. 
Um, over the years, of course, other people would have moved into the area and perhaps they had some help. But in the, in the, in the earlier years, they were all on their own. And then here you can see uh, the packing house. You can see this description of the beach, the wagon road, which is the trail down to the packing house. Um, you can see Love's Lane coming down to Mary's Chapel. Now, Mary's Chapel, having been built in the 1890s, the packing house was probably 10, 15 years old, maybe 20 years old uh, when Mary's Chapel was constructed. Um, and then uh, you can see the edge of the shell mound here is this hatch mark. And then down here, you can see Saunders store uh, at the southern end of the property and then his dock with the warehouse identical as we saw in the photograph I was showing you a minute ago. So, so this is kind of a recreated drawing of that web homestead farm. And then uh, if you go out here on the, what we call the high road sometimes or the homestead road, this is the one running on the south side of the point, it goes all the way out to White Cottage and all the way out to where Webb's original house was. This little trail right here was one of the very first trails ever created in Sarasota area. It's just amazing to me how much history has been preserved here. Um, most of you probably never seen a photograph of Saunders store, but this is the store that was located south of the packing house. They had the little railroad uh, rail that would run out on the dock so they could bring in freight and put, you know, put out vegetables and all that kind of thing. And um, there's really nothing left of this today. There are some dock piles remaining from the original dock. And this is the Ruby. Um, this is the first schooner that the Webbs purchased. Um, and they purchased the Ruby in 1874, which I think probably is about the time that they may have built the packing house. Now, it's also possible that when they first acquired the Ruby, they might not have had the packing house yet, in which case they would have probably taken a two-wheel cart and backed it into the bay. And then somebody would have been standing, you know, chest deep in water, uh, or waist deep at least, taking, you know, uh, orange crates and vegetable crates off of the wagon and putting it up on the schooner. Um, and that's miserable work, especially in the wintertime, you know, when the water's freezing cold. And so you could imagine that they would want a dock. Um, but again, the Ruby was a little schooner. You can see her here with almost, uh, with quite a few of her sails flying. There's still a few extra sails that they could attach on the top. And uh, she was uh, an older boat. Um, what's called five ton displacement, which basically means that as long as you, uh, that if you take the weight of the boat, subtract it from the five tons, that's how much you can carry without sinking. Um, so this was a decent boat uh, and served their needs in the early days, but then they very quickly found that uh, they had to make too many trips, you know, and that they wanted a larger vessel. The larger vessel that they built was the Vision. And we do not have a photograph of the Vision. And so this is an old fakey, fakey citrus product label that Spanish Point created years ago, Vision brand, and they did this little rendering. But the Vision looked a lot like the Ruby, just a lot bigger. The Vision was a 10 ton schooner and the Vision was built right at Spanish Point, uh, down where the boat yard is by Frank Guptill, who the Webbs had met when they were up at Cedar Key. Um, but that's a whole nother story and a whole nother Zoom. So we can't get into that today. But I love this label because it's got the cute little packing house in there. So I thought it'd be nice to just throw in a map um, because, you know, it's pretty much a straight shot south to Key West. You know, um, you just have to not miss it. You have to not miss it. You have to have enough fresh water to get there because fresh water is hard to come by. And um, you're out in the open Gulf. So you've got to keep an eye out to the weather. Uh, and again, they take a couple of days to go south, spend maybe a week in Key West, a couple of days to come back, two week round trip. Cedar Key is almost the same distance, uh, but in the records, um, it doesn't seem like they spend as much time there as I mentioned earlier, but it was you know two or three days to get up to Cedar Key. And I could imagine in the winter time, if you really read the weather, if you watch how the cold fronts work around here, you know, the wind will blow heavy from the south for a couple of days, get sucked up into that low pressure to the north, and then it all turns around and the nice cool wind blows from the north. I could see them leaving on that southern breeze, you know, knowing the cold front was coming, saying, hey, we got about a day and a half of hard wind out of the south sailing all the way up there. 
letting that wind turn with the cold front and then sailing all the way back. That would be a sailor's dream. Once they went to Pensacola, all the way out in the panhandle, but that was a much longer trip and it wasn't worth their while. They, they couldn't get any more for the products there than they could at Cedar Key and Key West. But I think it's interesting that they were exploring all these options. And if they'd had a larger boat, they probably would have sailed to New Orleans or, or Havana. I mean, those were the other big ports. Um, I'm sure that some of their products might have ended up, though, down in Cuba because people would come up from, you know, Cuba to Key West to buy things and go on back. So hard to say. This is the Phantom. Uh, this boat was not owned by the Webbs. It was owned by Will Hamlin uh, for a time and a couple of other owners. Uh, the Phantom, however, uh, started as a smaller boat and then ended up in Guptill's Boatyard where they say they cut it into quarters and made it longer and wider. And I cannot imagine how they would have done that, but that's the story. And uh, here's the Phantom out in front of the packing house when the packing house is looking pretty old. So, um, you know, this photograph could be from the teens. Uh, if you look back in the old newspapers, you see all kinds of news articles about the Phantom, you know, between like 1910 and, and World War I era. So that could be about when this photograph was taken, which again would make the packing house, you know, 30 years old at this point. You can see the wood has faded. But uh, I, I think it's, we, we have so few photographs of the packing house that I'm showing you every photograph that we have today this is one of them, and then the other one is the other one, and that's that's pretty much all we have. But here's here's a photograph from the Packing House dock showing the original magic. I think this is a pretty cool photograph. Casey Key in the background. Um, you've got a a, a, a a pulling boat here on the left, a rowing boat. You know, it's kind of fancy, really, for Florida. And then you've got a little power boat with a little centrally uh, mounted inboard engine there pointing out toward Casey Key with the gentleman in it. And then you've got uh, one of the web daughters, perhaps. I really don't know who's at the helm of magic in this photograph, but this is one of the photographs that was actually used to design, excuse me, the magic that we use for our tours today. And then this is a photograph that I believe is also on the Packing House dock. I believe these gentlemen uh, with John Webb on the far right-hand side are sitting on the top of the original magic. They're sitting on the roof with their feet uh, like around where the dock was, and you can see a little bit of the woods behind them there. But I believe this photograph was taken at Packing House Dock as well. By 1948, this was what was left of the Packing House. This is a photograph that was taken by a representative of the University of Florida, uh, Gordon Palmer. Uh, Bertha Palmer's grandson had returned to the property after World War II and wanted to restore things and open it back up to the public and showcase her gardens. And I've done a whole program on some of Gordon Heigl, uh, Gordon Palmer's activities. But at any rate, um, he had folks come down from University of Florida and document what the site looked like. And this is one of the photographs that they took in 1948. And this shows the old piles from the packing house. And so uh, we do not have any record of exactly when the packing house met its demise. Um, however, I can tell you that if it survived to 1921, it was eliminated by the 21 hurricane. That hurricane uh, wrecked major havoc on Osprey and Sarasota and Tampa and Havana and other places that it hit, but it took out, it was described as basically taking out all the buildings along the shoreline uh, that weren't already gone. Um, there was also um, a pretty significant hurricane in 1910 that took out a lot of boathouses and other things like that. Uh, by 1910, the packing house would have no longer been in use as a packing house. And so uh, articles about the damage in the 1910 hurricane really would not include anything about the packing house because nobody would have really cared at that point. I had a volunteer um, say one day that they had heard that the packing house had burned. I thought that was interesting and don't know much about that. Looking at this photograph, it looks like there's some darkness to the tops of these piles. Do you see these, these piles here? But, you know, this was fully out of the water. If it had burned, I would have thought, and these, these logs we believe are, are heart pine, they would have burned up and incinerated even if they were wet. So I think that the original packing house was probably damaged quite a bit by 1910 hurricane. And if there was anything left of it at all, wiped out 1921 
October of 23. Um, in the uh, mid 1980s, they started to work to develop plans to reconstruct the packing house as an interpretive center for historic Spanish Point. And you can see the plans right here showing the various profiles of the building, uh, single door coming off the east, double door coming out to the dock, double door coming down to the wagon road. And um, we'll show you some of these other plans. Here's all the details on the roof and all that stuff. And you know, the building codes require you to do certain things that the webs didn't have to do. So when you're in the building, you'll look up and see steel ties that connect uh, the walls to the roof. And of course, web wouldn't have had anything like that. But also the next time you're there, just look at the wood, uh, the rough sawn wood, the heft of it. Uh, they did a very good job trying to reproduce what a building of this era would have looked like and what it would have been made out of. And so um, it was all pine lumber. It appears to be pine logs that were the foundation and then uh, pine beams that would have supported it, pine siding, what they call up and down boards or what people would call board on batten. But uh, the old timers that I met in this area 30, 40 years ago, they said, oh, it's got old up and down boards on it. And uh, they just overlapped those boards and that kept out the rain. And then again, the original one probably had shingle roof, but the design was to go and put a metal roof on it, which is probably the last roof it had. So uh, in order to get this approved by the state of Florida and Sarasota County, it really had to be like an identical replica of what was there before because of the regulations. And so the width of the dock is very similar to what was shown by the existing piles and the old photographs and things like that. Um, some of you may know I had a long career with Sarasota County and in 1989 I was working in natural resources department one of the permits that I was assigned was the packing house at Spanish Point and these are my handwritten notes about the packing house describing the location, all the mangroves, the other wetland vegetation, uh, describing how uh, we thought that they should recess the building back away from the water a little bit so that you'd be able to see those original piles once the building was reconstructed. And you know that was kind of a crazy idea that we had um, because it was such a novelty to see these you know piles that could date from the 1870s that were still there, you know, well over a hundred years later. And and at the same time, it brought the building back out of the mangroves, so they didn't have to cut down all the mangroves there because that was kind of a no-no in the regulatory world at the time. But I'm I don't know. You got to be impressed by the beauty of my handwriting here, right? Um, and then this is a photograph that actually uh, my work colleague took of me at the shoreline. And uh, check it out. This is back before my beard went white. This is uh, October of uh, nine. This is actually probably late 1989 um, and uh, kind of fascinating. Here's the permit that was issued in November of 89. And then down here on the sketch, you can see how originally the building was going to be on top of the original piles on the sketch plan. But we stipulated, and here's the actual stipulation, that the packing house is to be set landward of the original location to protect the remnant piles and the mature mangrove vegetation. So for those of you that have taken a tour for me and I've pointed down and showed you those piles, I'm very proud of those piles because something I did in 1989 caused us to be able to see those piles today. And then here's a photograph of the new packing house when it was uh, first reconstructed. And you can see the boardwalk as it is today and the old wagon road. And uh, you can see a little wagon there. Uh, and this photograph I actually took, and this is my work colleague, George here, uh, checking out the uh, wagon. And uh, he was my supervisor and we were both doing a final inspection on the project. Here's the packing house as it looked in October of 1990 when it was brand new. And uh, here's what the view was from the packing house that same day. Notice how they rounded over the tops of the piles and made it look really nice and there was no handrail. These are the same piles that we have there today. So now it's practically a historic structure. It's 30 years old. Here's what it looks like today. Look at this contrast, a lot more mangroves. They've really grown in, kind of shades out that part of the dock and you know, a lot of times I think people just walk straight through the packing house to get out to the dock. It's so alluring to be out on the bay and see that expansive view. But I'll tell you, if you take your time to look around the packing house, there are so many cool things here. And I'm going to walk you through this real quick. Um, so really, it all starts at the Grove, right? 
And so uh, they did research to find the types of baskets that were used back in these early days of Florida citrus. And it's a wicker basket that has a little wood base in it. And this, of course, would just you'd hang over your shoulder and you'd be up on the ladder and just picking and putting in that that bag. And by the time that wicker basket got filled up, that was pretty heavy with citrus. You know, I mean, it was time to dump that into the the wheelbarrow or the wagon and go up and get some more. But we have two beautiful examples there on display right next to the, the double doors that would welcome the citrus and the other products in on the wagon road. And, and, and looking out the view on the right here, you see that again, the mangroves have grown in so much, you really, you don't have an unobstructed view of the wagon road, but the wagon road is the trail that you walk on to come on down to the packing house. And because it was the historic shoreline back then, and it's still the shoreline, sometimes when the tide is high, you wade to the packing house. Anyway, inside, the first thing that they did with the citrus was to wash it in salt water. They may have done this with some of the other vegetables too. They, you know, they're growing a lot of root vegetables and things that needed to be washed off before they were packed, send them to market. And they had very little fresh water, but they had a super abundance of salt water. So they just rigged up a pitcher pump to the salt water, which had the doubling effect of salt being, you know, antibacterial. They could really clean up the citrus. So they cleaned it all up and then they'd put it on the drying racks. Now, even if they hadn't washed it, they still would need to dry it. If you study early citrus culture and modern citrus culture too, if you take a citrus that's ready to pick off the tree and you put it in a carton or crate, it's gonna get damaged because the skin is very soft and pliable. If you leave it off the tree for several days, the skin toughens up and hardens up. And so that's what you needed to do so that you could then pack it safely to travel all the way to New York. You know, and if it didn't get there in good shape, you weren't going to make any money. In fact, you might lose money because you'd paid to ship it there. So the drying racks are kind of cool. And then um, there's a record of John Webb having created an orange sizer because, again, what he learned was that if you mixed up all the sizes of your citrus in a particular crate, you wouldn't get that much money for it. But if you could divide it up and you had, you know, premium large size citrus and medium size and small, you would get more money for those large ones. So they wanted to uh, be able to differentiate. Now you can sit there all day long and look at citrus and try to decide which one's a small and which is a medium and which is a large, or you can devise a little wooden assembly that has a slot that gets wider the further down it goes. And so I took this photograph yesterday some of these citrus are actually in the process of falling, but you jam the citrus in the top, the small ones fall in the first crate, the medium in the second crate, and the largest ones fall in the third crate. Or you might get a big lemon like this one that doesn't want to fall into any of them. That is super big citrus. But if you've, if you've been to Spanish Point campus, you might have seen this in action. If you're ever there, grab those citrus off the shelf and roll them down this thing. If you're there with your children or grandchildren, make sure they do it too. It's kind of fun to see all the citrus get sized, but this was a big part of selling a premium citrus because it was now graded. Then they would wrap it in tissue paper in each of the uh, crates, put the top on there and it'd be good to go. Um, there's a story about how the first year they shipped their citrus, they packed it in Spanish moss, right? You got plenty of Spanish moss. It's cushy. But unfortunately, by the time the citrus got to New York, it had rotted from, from too much moisture. There's a little display in the packing house that shows how you build a crate. They had to build their own crates. They weren't going to the crate store. I imagine some of the first crates were probably made from the leftovers of the wood that they used to build the packing house. And they didn't have a fancy color label back then. There wasn't anything like that sort of color lithography, you know, and, but John Webb had a stencil and that stencil resides at the University of Florida. And this is a image that was made from a copy of the original stencil. So this is actually what the crates look like. They went to Cedar Key and Key West and up to New York, John G. Webb, Osprey, Florida. And uh, I think it's great that in the packing house, we've got the entire process from the washing to the drying, to the grading, to the wrapping, 
to the building the crates themselves and then stacking up those crates and out the door they go onto the schooner. Um, so the next time you're there, really take a look around. And then if you, if you read everything on these display panels, you'll learn so much about early citrus and how they were trying to convince all these newcomers that were coming to Florida to grow citrus, don't put all the different sizes in the same box. Um, they also describe how if you arrange the citrus correctly, there's a place for every citrus and you don't want them to be able to move around in the crate. So that you want it, all the citrus to stick up a little bit beyond the top of the crate so that when you put the head on the crate, you put a little pressure on it that holds everything in place for the journey. At any rate, we often call this the pack, the citrus packing house. You know, it's, it's really the web packing house, but we often call it that. But everything left from the packing house, all the watermelons, the turnips, the sweet potatoes, the okra, all that stuff, probably fish left here too, pigs, anything that they were selling, eggs. Um, and it, we understand that they also shipped out other neighbors' products as well, because there were not a lot of docks and there there weren't really any other packing houses in the area. In fact, as far as packing houses go, um, this could easily be the very first packing house ever built in the region. Uh, while William Whitaker dabbled with citrus, um, he was more focused on fishing and cattle. Um, at any rate, uh, I've never heard of another packing house or we'll do than this one. Well, let's talk about John Webb's famous orange marmalade because uh, Again, you're growing citrus. You're always thinking about how can I make more money? Well, one way you can make more money is to create a premium product. And you take the rind of the citrus and you cook it and you add in a little cane syrup because you're growing, you know, you've got all the sugar cane and you got the cane syrup. You got everything you need to make some dandy orange marmalade. And we believe that this copper pot, which is in our collection from the Webb family, is the copper kettle that John Webb made his famous orange marmalade in. So that would have been from maybe 1880, probably all the way up to his death in 1908, he would have used this to make his orange marmalade. So I think it is amazing that we have such a thing. This is about two feet in diameter. Um, when I first came to Spanish Point, they said, well, this was the sugar kettle. I'm like, no, 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 no. Sugar kettles are like six feet in diameter, you know, five feet in diameter. You needed a much bigger thing. But um, the more I got to thinking about it and think, reading about John Webb's marmalade, this is exactly what you would have needed to make the marmalade. So how cool is that? And speaking of marmalade, um, you know, as we, uh, we kind of introduce food to Spanish Point with the food truck and the white cottage with the seating, uh, Wendy Deming approached me and said, John, if we were to do a product to sell, what should it be? And I said, we need to sell John Webb's orange marmalade. So anyway, we found it took us a long time to find a local person that could create this for us. But I found a company here in Sarasota. They've been around about 12 years and they do private label stuff and it's all well done. And it's like a family business. And so we talked to them about producing orange marmalade. Is it to John Webb's original recipe? No, we don't have his original recipe. I wish we did, but this is some delicious marmalade. And what you'll see is that it's branded packing house and it's got a picture of the packing house on it. And we are selling these 20 ounces for $9 at the Welcome Center Gazebo at Spanish Point, also in the gift shop at downtown Sarasota campus. Although I understand we are sold out in both locations ever since last weekend. And we've got a new shipment coming on Tuesday. So come on down. This would make a fantastic holiday gift. In fact, I'm planning on buying some of them so that I can take them home. So if any strangers show up at my house around the holidays and I didn't know they were coming, I'll have a nice little gift for them. But anyway, um, I think it's cool that we've revived the orange marmalade because not only is it a delicious thing for people to buy and have good memories of their visit to the campus, whether it's downtown or Spanish Point, but it's also tied to our history, which is really important. And so that kind of wraps up my slides and we'll stop screen sharing so that we can go back to uh, this format. And I am eager to take any questions that you might have. And I see we've got some things in the chat already. Was there any interaction between the webs and the Seminoles? That's a fantastic question, Ted. 
I've not seen any direct evidence of it, but I would not be surprised at all. Uh, in particular, they may have encountered Seminoles uh, even in Key West, uh, along the trip down to Key West, or even in eastern parts of Sarasota. While the 1860s are a little late uh, for a lot of Seminole activity here, uh, it would not have surprised me at all if they had crossed paths. So I think that's something that we need to research further, and uh, maybe one day we'll, we'll do better with that. Did the webs grow pigs, chickens, goats, and sheep? Uh, I'm going to say no to the sheep and no to the goats. And as far as pigs go, they just had to go out and find one. You know, there were so many wild pigs out in the woods. Of course, these were uh, pigs that uh, DeSoto and Ponce de Leon had brought over with the cattle and turned loose in Florida back in the 1500s. It was all just going crazy out there. So I don't think they had to raise up any of their own pigs. They did have some chickens. But also, um, they were not dependent upon chickens for eggs. There is documentation that they would go over to the bird islands and they would harvest um, a bucket of eggs or two buckets of eggs a week. And these would have been pelican, egret, heron, you know, all the different birds that are out there on those islands. Um, Okay, so I want to correct myself. It wasn't Ted that asked that good question about the Seminoles. It was Ted's wife, Judy. Yeah, so Judy, I'll give you credit for that question. All right, do we have any other questions, folks? We must have a few more questions. Well, no one, oh, the tape at the packet house said detergent was applied to wash the oranges. Would that have been alkaline soap? You did not mention this. Maybe I should listen to that tape. Um, I had never heard this before. I think that's fascinating. Um, we'll have to dig into that a little bit more. My understanding was they were cleaning with salt water, but uh, we'll have to study this up. Dennis probably needs to get some sort of consolation prize from me for asking me a question that I did not know the answer to. Leave it to Dennis for that. All right. How about some more questions that I can't answer, folks? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, Caitlin, do you have the ability to unmute everybody or no? Uh, I think I do. Okay. Oh, how did tissue paper come about? Okay. Well, this was just one of the innovations in citrus packing. What it allowed you to do is by wrapping every citrus with a piece of tissue paper, um, it made a better appearance when it got to market. So for instance, instead of shipping a dirty bushel of citrus that really wasn't worth any money, that then you know a fruit seller in New York would have to do something with it, they were buying premium citrus that had been cleaned, it had been graded, it had been individually wrapped. It was literally ready to take the head off of the crate and sell it right there. The only reason why I said, can you take the mutes off is because, okay, where did they get seed grow vegetables? That's a great huh. question. I would imagine they brought some of those with them. I imagine they bought others at Manatee. So the Manatee River was where they first came when they when they came down from New York, they stopped at, at Key West and then they sailed all the way up to the Manatee River. And that's where they spent quite a bit of time uh, looking for a place to homestead. They had originally planned to buy property there. The guy that was gonna sell them that property said, I'm not gonna sell it to you. So then they ended up down here and that's a whole nother story and a whole nother program. But um, but this uh, but I imagine they could buy seeds for many of these things at Manatee. They would have gotten the first starts for the sugarcane from Manatee because Manatee, 20 years before, had the huge um, sugarcane plantations, and so there was sugarcane growing all over up there. Same with bananas; they got some banana starts. Um, yes. One of the things that I like to say. Um, yeah is that Webb was selling bananas commercially 10 years before the first bananas were sold commercially in Florida. You know, he got left out of the banana history books. And uh, as far as bananas go, you know, bananas really weren't known to Americans until the uh, Centennial Expo of 1876 in Philadelphia. That was where bananas were introduced. If you hadn't been to Jamaica or the Caribbean, you'd never seen bananas before. Got some more questions. Was scurvy still a problem when they were selling citrus? I mean, scurvy's a problem today. I mean, a lot of people are probably walking around with scurvy and don't even know it because they don't get enough citrus. They don't get enough vitamins, you know. Uh, so it certainly would have still been a problem in Florida where people had diets that were composed of fish and meat and, you know, not a lot else. 
so probably still wasn't a thing. Um, what was John Brown's, uh, John Webb's background in New York? Um, he was a college professor. He was a chemist. He was a pharmacist. He was kind of a gentleman farmer. So he had a lot of knowledge, a lot of skills. He didn't come down to Florida kind of half baked or without eyes wide open. He, he knew that his family was going to be working hard and in a very pioneer area, but he had, uh, he had a lot of experience that he could put to bear. Um, how frequently did they ship goods to Key, Cedar Key or the market? I really don't know. Um, we probably need to go back through all the letters and start looking at the intervals. But I would imagine that it probably would have been every month or so in, in a high season when they had a lot of products. I doubt they would have gone more than once a month. I mean, that's a it's a risky sale. I mean, White Cottage originally had a widow's walk on top. And you know why they call it a widow's walk? Because the wife is waiting for her sea captain husband to come home and he doesn't come home, you know, and there's no electronics, there's no cell phones, there's no nothing. So you took off to Key West and they didn't know if you were getting home until you got home. So I don't think they made the. Have oh, I no, muted this whole time? Yeah. No, no, no. Just that last Whew. bit. Sorry, I had to mute him. All right. Good. How many <laughs> children did John and his wife had? They had five children. They all came down with them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the youngest daughter, Ginny, died early on. She was the first burial in the cemetery that created the cemetery. Um, Lizzie married Frank Guptill and, you know, lived in the Guptill house. Um, Utica, New York. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I went silent when I was saying Utica, New York. Um, and they had originally, they'd heard a lot about Virginia. They, they, the reason why they moved south was because of um, the asthma that John Webb's wife had. And the physician said she'd be better off in a southern climate. They'd originally looked at Virginia, I think. And then they heard about Manatee County. Um, did Bertha Palmer use the Packham House? No, uh, it does not appear that she had any use for the Packen House. And again, by the time she bought the property, uh, the Packen House may have already been uh, severely damaged or non-existent from 1910 hurricane. Don't know for sure. What was the population in 1870s in the area? Hmm, very low. Let's, let's talk about who was here. Um, there were a couple of families in Fruitville. There were a couple of families in Bee Ridge. There were a couple of families in what's now Nokomis. There was one guy living on Minnesota Key down Fort Inglewood. There was um, a few people living along the Bayfront in Sarasota, very few people, uh, down around Cherokee Park, uh, McClellan Park area, and then downtown proper, Whitaker's up to the north. Um, probably less than 100 people here, 1870. Um, in the census? Great question. Um, now, the person who asked Ann Madden asked the question about Bertha Palmer used the Packen House. Of course, when we think about the Palmers, we think about the, the groves um, that they created. What's all now Southgate was all the Palmer Hyde Park Grove. And that was all, you know, 1912 and up through World War I and then continued all the way through the 1950s. That was a massive citrus production, but they would not have... Um, the, the little packing house down here would have been of no use to them. Um, and then of course the celery fields was the, her son's agricultural legacy out there where, you know, the celery fields are now the nature center, Audubon nature center, but, um, but uh, you know, that was years later. Another question, when was the first road from Sarasota to Osprey? Well, actually Webb had to create a road to be able to get a post office. So by the mid 1880s, they had a little trail going up to Sarasota. It was paved with sand. They called it um, to, uh, they, they had a lot of names for these roads down here, but basically it was all based upon, I hope I get through the road, you know. And uh, the first paved road would have been just after World War I, when the Sarasota Venice Road and Bridge District created the first paved road in the district. Uh, I will mention that Osprey, of course, the name of the fish hawk, became the name of the post office that John Webb had at what's now White Cottage. And the Osprey Avenue in Sarasota is basically the road to White Cottage. It's the road to Osprey. 
So that's kind of next time you're on Osprey Avenue, tell your friends, say, hey, this is the road to Spanish Point campus. Any other questions, folks? Well, your timing is perfect. It is 2.59. Uh, we've had an awesome day. We had volunteer celebratory breakfast this morning that many of you had a chance to participate in. I was happy to see many of you there. Wish the best of holidays to everyone. Look forward to seeing you all um, in either the next couple of weeks or in 2022. And uh, we'll be back to do some more history. And we're just going to keep chipping away at the various things on the campus so that everyone can appreciate them more, know more about them, share that with the guests who come and uh, entice um, folks to, you know, that are more familiar with downtown to come down our way. And uh, hopefully folks that are, you know, loyal to Spanish Point will come up and enjoy downtown Sarasota campus as well. And I would like to say that I certainly appreciate all the hard work and dedication that all of you volunteers contribute. Without you, we are not Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. And I think, you know, Jennifer really emphasized that this morning. And it's so important that you understand how much we like working with you. And, uh, and I'm very appreciative of all the fine comments that you're putting in the chat. I do appreciate that. It is my pleasure and what I live for is to research this history and share it with you and share, so that you can share it with others because I think it really enriches our lives. So anyway, thanks for joining us today. And I'm glad we can talk about the packing house and next week, come down and get your packing house marmalade because your friends are going to like this as a nice holiday gift. And, uh, we ordered lots of it. So there'll be plenty of it. Come on down. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank and, you, guys. And thank you, Caitlin. Thanks, yeah. Sean. And thank you, Mindy, in the background. It yeah, takes a village you. to produce a Zoom. <laughs> Y'all have a good weekend.